Hello everyone and welcome to today's Savvy Investor webinar, Sustainability in the World of Money Market Funds in partnership with BNP Paribas Asset Management. This webinar first aired live on our webinar platform, so if throughout the session you hear any references to things like the live Q&A at the end or the Q&A box, then that would be why. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful speakers. I hope you really enjoyed today's session. ESG, uh, SRI, Green Bonds, SFDR, UNPRI, all these terms relate to sustainable finance and there are plenty more. I'm Mark Fleury, co-head of liquidity solutions team within BNP Paribas Asset Management. And we will help you together with Sheila and Thibault understand what sustainable investment means for BNP Paribas Asset Management, in particular when it comes to money market fund management. Uh, so during this webcast, which should last 45 minutes, questions included, Thibault Malin, our product specialist on money market fund, will explain how we implement sustainable investment in our money market funds, which is a very specific market, market and therefore it needs a very specific approach when it comes to sustainable investment. I will provide a few examples on how we communicate around our sustainable investments within our funds. And we will start with Sheila Terlag, who is our global head of ESG specialists within BNP Paribas Asset Management, who will hopefully convince you how committed BNP Paribas Asset Management is to sustainable investment, how recognized we are on this by the industry, and Sheila will also give you a word on regulation around ESG. So Sheila, I leave it to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, I go to my, my first slide. So um, here, I think, I, I, I hope we are, will be convincing because we did start in 2002 uh, looking at uh, um, funds that are now ESG. So at the time we launched our first socially responsible investment fund. In 2006, we were among the first signatories of the UN principles, so um, right there when, when it started. In 2012, we implemented the United Nations Global Compact principles and sector policies in all our open-ended funds. And um, if I fast forward to more recently, uh, where we had a kind of a, a big bang in terms of uh, sustainability, it's in 2019, in March, when we launched our global sustainability strategy and our new coal policy. So at this, at this point in time, we, we, we had reflected on how to go forward and become uh, more instrumental in uh, changing the way things are, are working in, uh, in the world. And we thought that it would be better instead of just having a few funds like that first one we launched that um, are sustainable, is to have all our funds in the range being, uh, in, in our fund range being uh, sustainable, or in any case, as many as possible to, you know, to get that done. So in 2020, that's last year, we enhanced our scoring and um, modified our voting guidelines to add uh, more um, things around uh, diversity. And in 2021, we launched our biodiversity roadmap. I'm telling you what I think, you know, how, I, how sustainable we think we are, but we do also get people from outside of, uh, of BNP PAM um, giving us accolades. And here there are three, which I will speak about briefly. Share Action, we were, you know, in the top three global responsible investment managers, and that's uh, worldwide. In, uh, for WWF, they consider us a global leader in sustainable investing. And um, based on the figures and data from uh, Broadridge, there we can see that we're number one in sustainable thematic uh, strategies uh, for cross-border funds. Uh, here you can see how share action, well, on what share action was assessing us. So on responsible investment governance, climate change, human rights, and biodiversity. 
So we're number two, just behind Robeco, and you can see uh, the names of uh, some of our competitors uh, below. What's interesting to note is that despite the, well, we we're very proud, of course, of being in, in you know, one of the top five, but what uh, I must tell you is that it's uh, like S&P rating. So it goes from AAA to D. And uh, we are single A, which means that according to share action, even if we're good and among the best, they believe we could, uh, we could do better. Another uh, final uh, look at um, how, how, we, how people see us from uh, outside is Squarewell, who's a leading shareholder advisory firm. And they analyze 30 of the world's largest asset managers' investment policies and their approach to, to climate. And they looked at the voting record. So uh, if you look at the graph on the, on the right, you will see that um, in terms of um, the axis, the vertical axis, uh, you can see the assets under management, and horizontally, you can see the, the votes uh, support for climate-related shareholder proposals. So this is of last year, 20, from between 2018 and 2020. And you can see that BNP PAM is at 93% supporting uh, those, uh, those proposals, which is rather high nobody else is above 90 and and the rest are more like you know around 85 so um, so this i think is another testament to to that in terms of our approach it has uh, six pillars in total four we can find in all the funds that we uh, that we manage that um, the, the few exceptions there might be to a sustainable investment approach would include things like uh, an et a market etf and s p 500 for example um, what do we have in all four? We have uh, ESG integration across all investments, and uh, this is to improve our risk-adjusted uh, returns. Um, the second one is around stewardship, so that includes voting and engagement. Of course, on a money market fund, we would not really vote for the underlying unless we also had the equity. and. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, we, we, uh, we, of course, will engage with, with the companies, the worst performing uh, companies. Um, if we look at uh, the third pillar, that would be responsible business conduct. I touched on it. And uh, these are some companies we will uh, exclude because um, we want to avoid reputational, regulatory, uh, or a stranded uh, asset uh, risk. Um, and the fourth will be a forward-looking perspective that we call the three E's, and those three E's are um, environmental, uh, sorry, energy transition, environmental sustainability, and equality and inclusive growth. Now, for us, these three E's are uh, three preconditions for more sustainable returns, more sustainable companies, and a more sustainable world. So we will use these three E's that will guide us in our stewardship activities and our research activities. When we look at companies, we'll look them for that, uh, from that perspective uh, when, we, when we study them, for example. And then we come to the fifth pillar, which we call Sustainable Plus. And these are uh, strategies that um, include the first four pillars I mentioned, but then go a step further. So that can be enhanced ESG, thematic funds, impact funds, some funds are enhanced and thematic, and the vast majority of these funds will also have some kind of label. So underneath you can see uh, um, the SRI label of France, ESR, uh, Toward Sustainability of Bel Belgium, and a couple of other ones. And then finally, we have the, the sixth pillar, which is around walking the talk. We are really quite demanding with the companies in which we invest, so we feel that we have to have the corporate practices and the disclosures that should be at least, uh, you know, match or exceed the, what we expect from, from those entities in which we invest. In terms of the integration, this is overseen by a formal validation committee. So each strategy will explain to uh, a committee that includes uh, the global head of sustainability and the CIO of, uh, of the asset class. Um, and they will tell her, uh, they will tell them 
uh, exactly how well, they will tell them. They have told them because this has been done for the for all our all our strategies. How they plan to integrate it, and uh, the committee will then uh, decide whether that is this is good enough. Uh, whether they need to go back to the drawing board to show that it's well integrated into the philosophy, into the research, into the stewardship and engagement, and finally into the KPIs and uh, reporting. We will be, um, uh, through, because of the SFDR, we have uh, decided that for Article 8, which is, uh, which is where we have to give some binding criteria, we have actually made KPIs and, report, and reporting binding. So where here we say we should aim to hold portfolios with more positive ESG. In fact, we, we, we aim to hold, and that, those are, that's one of the binding characteristics of the Article 8 funds. All the money market funds are Article 8 funds. And the second part is to uh, aim to hold portfolios with a lower carbon footprint than their respective uh, benchmarks. In terms of responsible business conduct, what are the kinds of companies and, uh, that we would be excluding from our, all our universe of investments, so whatever, whatever the, the fund or the, the strategy? These would be around the United Nations Global Compact and OECD guidelines for uh, multinational enterprises. And uh, these two universal benchmarks are based on the principles around human rights, labor rights, the environment, and uh, anti-corruption. And second of all, we have a number of sector policies. So for the first few, the ones which are marked as exclusions, controversial weapons, coal, tobacco, asbestos, we have very strict limits above which when a company has an activity in one of those areas, we will not invest in the company. Uh, for coal, for example, uh, as you can see on the right, it'll be uh, we exclude companies with more than 10% of their revenues coming from thermal coal. Controversial weapons is from zero, you know, as, as soon as they have any controversial weapons, we don't, we don't invest. Um, then we have some sectors <clears throat> which have where we have minimum sector requirements, and uh, this can be palm oil, uh, wood pulp, nuclear, mining. In these sectors, which are, are necessary for, for human activity, um, we don't want to just say, if you do palm oil, you're out. But if you do it, you have to do it in a responsible way. So there is um, a responsible sourcing of palm oil um, requirements that uh, companies can, uh, can be in line with. On the right is our coal policy. I mentioned we launched it in 2019. And in terms of thermal coal mining, it's really quite strict. Um, I mentioned the exclusion with, of, of activity, but also coal extraction, uh, which is above 10 million tons a year, companies with plans for new coal, and then also companies that have no phase-out commitments, 2030 in the OECD and 2040 for non-OECD. In terms of power generation, we look at that in terms of carbon intensity. And uh, we follow the sustainable development scenario of the um, International Energy Agency, and we will adapt to that as, as it changes over time. In terms of our ESG scoring methodology, I briefly mentioned at the beginning that we had reviewed it last year. And what did we do? Well, we went from just over 4,000 companies that we um, that we analyzed, and that was fine when we were just looking at a few SRI funds, to more than 12,000 companies and more than 13,000 actually today, which we divide into different peer groups. And there are 80 of those peer groups that are divided among 20 sectors that we have uh, divided our universe into, and also four geographical areas. Each sector is going to be analyzed according to the specific features of that sector. And each company will be uh, analyzed within its peer group and assessed and ranked within that peer group. So what I've put on, on the right of this slide to give you, to give you a bit of a, an example that you can, you can you know, envisage how, how that works, it's for the financial sector. I chose the financial sector because I know that it's the biggest sector present inside money market funds, so it will correspond to many of, uh, of the assets held, uh, held in the funds. So we have the three pillars, environment, social, and governance, and we give different importance to each pillar. And for each sector, 
The importance given to each pillar may vary depending on which are the ones that we consider to be the most material. In this case, you can see it's the governance pillar for, um, for finance. And the 11 themes under in, you know, on each uh, pillar, there are you know, four or five depending, uh, three to, to four depending on the pillar. There you can see the themes that are also across every single sector. What is going to change for each sector will be the weights of these themes and also the underlying data that we're using to, uh, to look at these themes. So in terms of climate change, that'll be the same across all and um, that will be, uh, we will be looking at basically at carbon emissions and um, greenhouse gas reduction um, projects, for, programs, for example. We'll also look at environmental risk management. And here, what are we trying to find here? It's whether the companies have the framework, the procedures and the processes uh, to manage adverse impacts on, on the environment and, uh, and also to, you know, to manage their act actively their environmental goals that, that they will have because we're asking companies to have you know, their own goals as well. Um, we will also be looking at responsible asset, asset management uh, whether the, they have a sustainable financial initiative, and you know, basically whether their wi willingness to uh, to finance the transition, and one of the main way ways we're going to look at that, particularly in banks, is uh, whether they integrate ESG in their credit and loan standards. Then we look at the social pillar, which uh, you know we have classic human capital management, health and safety, not such a big deal in in banks and um, how they treat external stakeholders. So that is quite important. And then the incidence. The incidence is really the biggest part of this pillar. And here we're looking at um, issues around data privacy, security, social impact of products, marketing practices. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at there. In terms of uh, governance, this is really the, the biggest pillar. And uh, in the financial sector, we will be looking at uh, the board structure, the independence of the board. We will look at the remuneration, whether it's excessive or not, but also look at uh, the responsible investment program, whether they have one, whether they have whistleblower programs, um, whether they're, they're looking to be diverse, et cetera. So these are, these are some of the um, underlying da data that you can find linked to, to these pillars. Now, Mark mentioned the, the acronym SFDR at the beginning of, uh, of the, the presentation, and that, of course, is the Sustainable Finance uh, Disclosure Regulation. I mentioned already that you know, all products are classified, all our um, money market funds are classified under Article 8, and these are funds that promote environmental or social characteristics. And it's just to say that it's not just something for funds, it's for managed portfolios, it's for pension products, pension schemes, uh, you know, personal European uh, uh, pensions. So it, it really goes across the whole gamut of what you can offer in insurance products, what you can offer to um, a retail client and, uh, and of course, to, uh, uh, to all your, your clients. And so the idea is to establish more harmonized rules for, for the market. So, um, somebody looking and comparing products will be able to really compare apples to apples. In terms of the implementation, well, it's already you know, started. So uh, the level one was um, uh, put up at product level, and that is now you know, you know which funds and which uh, products are Article 6, 8, or, or 9. And uh, at the end of this month, we will be uh, disclosing the principal adverse impacts at firm level. So that's at the end of June. And in, uh, in January, we will be looking to go to level two, so where we will include more information on how and to what extent all these uh, products are tax, you know, include taxonomy compliant activities. And this will be put, of course, in the prospectuses and the report. So this is the end of, of my part. I pass, uh, I pass on to, uh, to Thibault. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Sheila, for enlightening us about the ESG framework and about the recent evolutions of the ESG regulation, which has, which has been significant these last months. So moving on to how we implement 
ESG in our money market funds. First, um, we know that as fixed income asset managers, we have a role to play in uh, making the world more sustainable. Sheila mentioned that in 2002, BNP Paribas Asset Management launched its first socially responsible investment fund. In 2004, we launched our first money market SRI fund, BNP Paribas Moi ESR, which has been following a best-in-class approach since. So this is a capability that BNP Paribas Asset Management's money market team has been having for a while. We here want to simply respond to one simple question. Why does it make sense to implement ESG criteria into money market funds? Well, money market funds are major contributors to the functioning of companies' treasuries, including corporate and financial ones. So we believe at BNP Paribas Asset Management that we should favor those companies which are the best ESG performers, which have positive ESG performance. Before we talk about implementing and how we implement ESG in our money market funds, uh, let's see what are the constraints proper to the money market funds industry. First, let's keep in mind that money markets are an offer market and not a demand market. It means ESG-wise, that it is very difficult to overwave a very positive ESG contributor, but with low level of issuance. And conversely, it is very difficult to underwave slightly negative ESG contributors, but with significant level of issuance. Second, the time to market, proper to money market industry, is, makes it even more difficult. Some issues are only present in the market and offered for a few seconds. It makes it difficult to overwave or underwave a specific issuer. Third, at the moment, there is no or limited offer of green CPs and green deposits, plus the use of proceeds embedded in, this, in these securities are not comparable to those of medium or long-term grid bonds. Fourth, let's keep in mind, and Shilia mentioned it, there is a financial bias in the money market funds industry linked to the outstandings. For instance, in the new CP market, there is more than two thirds of the issues that are issued by financial issuers. And last but not least, the benchmark of money market funds are interest rates, Ionia, Esther, Fed funds, or Sonia. These are not basket of securities. So ESG-wise, it makes it very difficult to assess the ESG performance of one fund against its investment universe. Now, how do we integrate ESG in our money market funds at BNP Paribas Asset Management? First, very simply, we favor issuers with better than average ESG scores. Second, we engage with lower rated entities on which we want to invest. We do not exclude it at first, and we help these companies, how these companies operate, and we help improve behaviors ESG-wise. We do not proceed to further exclusions than that, than those of BNP Paribas Asset Management's responsible business conduct that Sheila described. Third, we define an investment universe proper to the money market fund industry and calculate the ESG score of this investment universe. And we set as objective for all our money market funds to outperform the ESG score of this investment universe, on which we are going to provide you with more detail in the next slide. But before that, a last comment. Um, we consider other indicators, such as carbon footprint, but we have to keep in mind for money market funds that carbon footprint can be very biased for these funds. For one reason that we exposed previously, money market funds have a financial bias. And when you consider scope one, scope two, and scope three CO2 emissions of a financial issuer in its activity, these issuers will, by definition in their activity, have much lower CO2 emissions than those of 
uh, of uh, industrial issuers. So we commit ourselves to aim at having a better CO2 footprint than our investment universe. But uh, we wanted to remind you that this is something that could arm the diversification to money market funds. So for this reason, we do not set as objective in our funds prospectus to outperform the CO2 footprint of, um, of our investment universe. Now, what is our investment universe and what are the impacts and of all the constraints of the money market funds on this investment universe? Our investment universe is defined by all the short-term debt issuers and money market issuers. It represents approximately 3,000 issuers. Our money market funds range can be easily split into three categories. On the left-hand side of the table is presented our AAA money market funds, which is the most conservative money market solution in the market. On the right-hand side, you can see our three-month funds which present more flexibility that will enable these funds to offer a higher risk return profile. And in the middle of the table is presented our SRI money market funds. Here you can see this table as a funnel. The first layer represents the number of issuers or issuer groups that are covered by our internal credit analysis and by our risk team. On the second layer, you can see the number of issuers that are considered as being of high credit quality in the money market environment. So these are the number of issuers that are eligible to all our money market funds at first before any, cons any specific constraint to any fund. You can see that on the right hand side, our three month funds are mo have more flexibility because uh, these 390 issuers remain eligible to these funds, meaning that as at end of May, 94 issuer groups were present in the portfolio, representing 136 entities. When you apply an SRI filter following a best-in-class approach in the middle of the table, you can see that there is an incidence on the number of issuers that remain eligible to these funds. 290 entities remain eligible because we eliminated at least 20% of the worst ESG contributors to each sector. It means a reduction there of 27% of our investment uh, universe. And at the end, 83 issuer groups remain uh, in the portfolio at the end of May. And other portfolios have significant constraints, such as our AAA funds on the left-hand side of the slide. You can see that only 190 entities remain eligible to the fund because these funds follow a very strict approach regarding the credit quality of issuers uh, being minimum A1 short-term S&P ratings. And you can see that the diversification for these portfolios is different from the others. Now, all our portfolios follow the same ESG approach. We implemented it the same way into, the same way into all our funds. However, there is a specificity for SRI funds, as you can see on this slide. Now, to, to put it in a nutshell, we implemented ESG in all our money market funds range. Any money market fund that is presented and offered to the public implements the same ESG criteria uh, the way Sheila and I just, uh, Sheila and myself just described to you. To sum up our strategy uh, regarding ESG, we do not invest in companies, we, we do not exclude companies that are weakly rated in terms of ESG without engaging actively with these issuers. And if these issuers do not respond to our engagement, we might consider disinvesting from these entities. And lastly, I remind you with the objectives of our money market funds, which is to outperform the benchmark scores, the investment universe that we just described you. And we are committed to publish all necessary indicators and even further on our institutional website and in our monthly flip books. Some indicators such as the ESG score or the carbon footprint are already available to you. One thing that Sheila mentioned uh, is the coverage rate required by the regulation, all our money market funds being Article 8. The coverage rate 
in terms of ESG analysis of all our portfolios must be at least of 90%. And we are very proud at BNP Paribas Asset Management to say today that all our money market funds have reached a 100% coverage rate as at end of May 2021. I know hand over to Mark, who is going to explain you further about these different indicators and what to consider as an investor. Thank you very much, uh, Thibault. So, yes, the question is, if you want to invest in a money market fund, what should you consider? The first thing is, as Sheila highlighted it, there is now regulation and it helps. Uh, that's where SFDR is. So an easy check prior to investing is make sure that the money market fund you are using is Article 8 under SFDR. It's probably difficult, if not impossible, to find a money market fund which would be under Article 9 because of what Thibault highlighted in his presentation. The only assets which a money market fund can buy uh, do not enable us to manage a fund under Article 9. Uh, there are no green CPs, uh, no green term deposits or those kind of things. So Article 9, probably impossible, but definitely go for Article 8. The second thing, which is only valid for French money market fund, but you know that the French money market fund industry is the third biggest in Europe after Ireland and Luxembourg, so it is important. The French regulator has asked French domiciled funds to categorize themselves based on how they manage their funds on a sustainable point of view but also based on whether or not they have an external sustainable label, which means an external assessment, or we can even say an external audit. So when it comes to French funds, uh, if they have an external social responsible investment label, they can be categorized under category one. For French funds that have a sustainable approach which is more or less the equivalent to Article 8 of SFDR, they can be categorized under Category 2, and the rest of the funds would be under Category 3 under the French regulation. So this information, it can be found in the fund's prospectus. You have on the screen an extract of our Luxembourg CCAV BNP Paribas Instacash, which clearly mentions that all our sub-funds are category eight under SFDR. So when it comes to reports on our website, which is open to public, all our money market funds now disclose their respective ESG score split per E, S, and G contribution, but also their carbon footprint. When it comes to our monthly reports, which are sent to our clients, we provide both SFDR and AMF sustainable classification, the breakdown of ESG scores by issuers, and very important, the evolution of our ESG score. We want to lead the industry when it comes to transparency on what we do around sustainability. So that's why we thought those kind of uh, features were important uh, when it came to reporting. So as a conclusion, before we start answering questions, uh, the key takeaways are the following. So first of all, regulation is there. It's helping all of us understand and let's say rank the sustainability approach of asset managers funds. There is a clear focus on sustainable investment. We now have clients who require a sustainable approach to money market fund or else they will not invest. The money market fund industry has its own characteristics, its constraints, its specificities. 
which require a specific approach to sustainable investment, which cannot just copy paste what's being done on the fixed income space, for instance. BNP Paribas is well established on sustainable investments, as always been, and is committed to lead the industry on this. And you saw it uh, with uh, Sheila's presentation, we are recognized for that. So that's why, as a conclusion, we can say that we can proudly even say that BNP Paribas is definitely ahead of its peers when it comes to sustainable investment, but also when it comes to sustainable investment implementation within money market funds. So we are now down with the presentation. We thank you very much for attending. We now have some time to answer the questions which were uh, raised during the this webcast. So um, we can probably start with Sheila. We have this question uh, which says, do you see any further sustainability regulation to impact the market, in particular cash management? Sheila? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, I, I do hope that we're seeing, um, I mean, in, in, in any case in Europe, it's all quite well planned how it's uh, how it's happening so i mentioned that you know we have the the different stages of the sfdr so i don't think that in europe we will see more or that it affects more money market funds because it's really you know the the whole investment universe that is affected by uh, by the the you know this this new regulation what i do imagine is that um, there will be more regulations coming out elsewhere in the world um, rather than than Europe? So, uh, so that I think that I think will, is is where the developments will happen elsewhere. And hopefully, given that Europe was number, you know, the first coming out with regulation, many people will imitate that uh, around the world. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Another question, and this one, it's probably more for Thibault. Um, the question is, does investing sustainability, sustainably mean sacrificing returns? Uh, it's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, it depends the way you implement uh, sustainability into your fund. As for money market funds, you can see that in our money market funds range, we implemented two different ways. The way we implement ESG criteria is common to all our funds. And we also have an additional filter for SRI labeled money market fund following a best in class approach. Um, more or less, there are no impact into implementing ESG uh, when you set um, for your fund to beat the investment universe score. However, when uh, you follow a best in class approach, which we favor for our SRI labeled funds, we estimate that in the, under the current market conditions, there is an impact of between three to five basis points for any fund that would in, follow the same approach. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Thibault. Another question for you as well, Thibault. The question is, do you see investing in non-sustainable funds as more of a risk than investing in sustainable funds? It's a good question as well. Um, as we speak, uh, at BNP Paribas Asset Management, we implement already uh, a sustainable risk assessment into our own credit analysis of the issuers. Our credit analysts already take into account climate risks, uh, water risk, forest risk for, for any company uh, that uh, proceeds its activity and on which we are allowed to invest. Um, so I would say that any uh, fund should be concerned into taking into account these risks uh, when it comes to investing. So yes, sustainability uh, shall be measured as a risk and uh, it might be riskier to invest into non-sustainable funds. Okay. Uh, another question, this one for Sheila. Um, it says, 
which ESG rating providers do you use in your global ESG score and for your ESG scores for both corporates and sovereign issuers? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, um, in terms of the providers, we uh, we do not use the actual ratings of the providers. We use the underlying criteria that they use to make their ratings. So, uh, we wouldn't just take the ratings of uh, Sustainalytics, which we use a lot for the the E and uh, and the S characteristics but really what they use is underlying data. And then we will use, um, so those are, that's mainly for the E and the S, we use ISS for uh, the governance. Uh, and again, using their underlying data. And then we use uh, true cost for uh, carbon, uh, carbon footprint. So, uh, so those are the main, the main ones for corporates. And when we're looking at sovereigns, are the biggest, the you know most of the the underlying data from will come from beyond ratings. Okay, thank you for that, Sheila. Uh, question for Thibault. Uh, the question is: How do you treat liquidity and deposits? Are they out of the scope of the ESG analysis? This is a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, the, the instruments that are out of scope from our ESG analysis in all our funds are the cash at site, the reverse repurchase agreements, and the repurchase agreements. The instant rate swaps, of course, because there is no exchange of principal. Uh, and that's pretty much all for our money market funds. All other instruments, which represent the bulk of our assets, are analyzed. Okay, um, another question for Sheila is, so the question is, you have mentioned a few exclusion criteria. Do the funds go further than that on the negative criteria to exclude perhaps pornography or alcohol? So concerning uh, pornography, uh, alcohol, um, and uh, Weapons. Uh, they're, they're, they're for the funds which are uh, SRI have an SRI um, label, so the label ISR, and in the, this case it's moi ISR. The, there are exclusions in terms of pornography, alcohol, um, and uh, and weapons that are added to the exclusion criteria I mentioned. But all the funds do not uh, do not have that, and uh, I must say that there is a lower uh, it's a threshold. It's not from zero. It's you know uh, the activity has to have revenues of of uh, above ten percent. Okay, and maybe uh, well we can probably still deal with two two questions. Uh, question, a question for you, Sheila, around um, Sharia compliance. Are any of these funds Sharia compliant? So I don't know if you would consider this as a sustainable investment approach. Uh, for me, Sharia compliance is very specific, and uh, and uh, none of uh, the, the money market funds uh, do not have that. So, um, so that this is not there. They wouldn't be. I I don't think excluding uh, ten percent would be, uh, uh, you know, Sharia compliant. But as far as I know, they're not. Okay. Bo, um, uh, you maybe uh, last. Oh. No, I completely agree with. What you just said, Sheila. Okay, thanks. Okay, a, a last question, and sorry for those who have asked questions, but uh, there are too many, so we won't be able to answer to all of them. Uh, Thibault says the analysis of an issuer inclu includes ESG apart from credit metrics. What's the weight of this ESG factor in the investment decision in comparison to, for instance, pure financial metrics? It's a good question as well. Uh, the way we analyze companies within our internal uh, credit assessment, uh, we split two different ratings representing uh, the solidity rating and the fundamental value of the issuers. Uh, the combination of these two parameters provide some feedbacks to our risk team to give us some limits in terms of amount and maturities. And uh, among uh, this scheme, 
15% of the fundamental value is represented by the sustainable, the sustainable risk assessment. So it, okay, it, it uh, can impact... It can impact the investment right, so, decision sorry, so because okay. this issuer could uh, could become uh, ineligible to us for uh, sustainable okay, thank uh, you for, for having Thibault. a significant sustainable risk assessment. It's now forty six minutes. We've started the, this webcast. We do have other questions. Uh, we also have the name of the people who asked those questions. So we'll revert to you individually on your question with your uh, day to day contacts. Uh, in the meantime, just want to thank you all of you uh, for attending this session, even though it's, it was quite long for a webcast, we're aware of this, but we thought the topic was of importance. And as you can see, there was a lot to say. And if we had wanted to answer all the questions, it could have lasted much more. Thank you very much to all of you for attending and happy to answer your questions either with your day-to-day -day contacts, but we will revert to you all individually uh, for those who've asked questions. Thank you very much and goodbye.